three, two, one. Welcome to a beta talk, which is a renewable podcast. Uh, we've got a very interesting episode for you today. Firstly, I'd like to thank my sponsors for season two, which has come to an end, which was MCS certified. And we're now in our interim period before I sort of go into uh, season three, but I've got a fantastic episode for you today. It's the first one I'm doing. Um, it's not the first one I'm doing over Zoom, but it's the first one where I'll upload the video uh, file as well for you to maybe look at as well. So I'm gonna introduce you to my guests. I've got Lee Fisher, who's an engineer I know. Lee's up in uh, Lincoln. Very, very good engineer if you're up that way. Uh, he's a gas engineer, but he obviously knows a little bits and pieces about renewables as well. I'm gonna introduce you to Richard, who I've had on the show before. Richard's involved in policy and he worked, you know, he's the U uh, Energy UK Research Centre. Have I got that right, Richard? Uh, the UK Energy Research Centre. Good. And also we've got Jan Rose uh, now. Have I got that right, Jan? Did I mention that right? Jan Rosenau, yeah. Rosenau, and you're also involved in policy and you're, well, the acronym is RAP, which is the, and you're the European Director of the Regulatory Assistance Project. Now I'm going to bring you, uh, you in first because you and Richard have just wrote some bit of, or well, you've just wrote a paper on something. So let's talk about that. So Jan, what have you written? Sure. Thanks, Nathan. So we, you know, we asked the question, what's the opportunity that we have to decarbonize heating in the next five to 10 years? And we very quickly came down to agreeing that it's going to be some combination of energy efficiency, but also electrification. And we asked the question in the paper, how can we do this in a way that actually benefits, you know, the energy system, consumers, and also the planet by reducing carbon. So that's the question we asked, and that kind of drove you know the research that we've done in the report. Now, you have you and Richard worked on reports before? Was this the first collaboration you did both together? Indeed, it was. We haven't worked before this report. We met at a conference, I think, in 2018, organised by the National Infrastructure Commission on heat. So that's where we first met, and I followed Richard's work ever since. Because Richard, I've, I've interviewed before. You, you, uh, you, you did a quite an interesting thesis. I don't know if you actually read that, Lee, but you'd enjoy that. But what was your thesis about, Richard? <laughs> uh, interesting. <laughs> Thanks very much, Nathan. Uh, yes. Yeah, so my thesis looked at uh, lobbying and how recent policies developed about sustainable and low carbon heating in the UK. Uh, and yeah, I mean, um, the relationship that Jan and I have developed has been great, and we, we've really got similar interests. And um, we have. Uh, I guess we have uh, professional relations as well. Um, but yeah, I, I think it will be the start of a very positive relationship. I mean, it's been great so far. Um, and the report that we that we worked on, um, I think um, because both of us have uh, done uh, the things that we sort of said in the report ourselves. Yeah. Um, and, and we both um, got to know each other better through you know, speaking about how our systems are working and what we were planning. Um, and then it was only really um, November last year when we started working on this report, um, which was published in March. Um, and we actually, uh, we're doing a, um, a seminar, an online seminar on it, um, which will be on, um, it's a Thursday coming. Um, and we've got over 600 people signed up. Um, so um, <clears throat> it seems to have been really popular. Um, and I think it will be the start of um, hopefully uh, many reports. And we've already spoken about doing lots more research work together. So um, it's great. How, how do people find that seminar if, if, they, if they want to? Uh, so the link uh, is on the uh, RAP website, I think, Jan. But also we've both shared it on Twitter. Um, I think, Nathan, you might have retweeted it earlier as well. Um, so we can retweet it again. Um, I'm not sure whether it will be recorded because we're doing it live. Yeah. Um, but we can check on that. Well, if, hopefully if I get this recording out, I can actually then put the link on, on the uh, description of the podcast. Now, what, what was the main findings of your sort of uh, report that you did or what, what, was, what were the sort of conclusions you come to? So if I may answer that question, uh, Nathan, you know, one uh, argument that's sometimes being made uh, when people consider installing a heat pump um, is that you know, we simply can't scale this up because the power system won't be able to cope. I'm sure you've heard those arguments before. You know, there would be issues with the local network and significant peaking problems. So the, the main finding from our work was that actually heat pumps can be quite flexible 
if you allow them to do that and if you schedule them in a smart way rather than just fit and forget and that's what both Richard and I have done so we actually don't run our heating system pretty much between four and seven in the evening uh, and you know that delivers significant cost savings but also of course reduces the peak you know, when you when you actually look at our consumption it's really low between four and seven o'clock in the evening are you both on uh, Agile Terrace, Octopus Energy? Is that, are you both on it? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to bring in Lee, because obviously Lee is a good friend of mine and a, a good engineer, and obviously you're very much involved with gas mainly, aren't you, Lee? Now, Indeed. From an engineer's perspective, what do you think are the main hurdles for, for the sort of the mass of electrification of heat, really? God, the chasm's huge. How long have we got, Nathan? Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think, um, Rich, on yours, you've gone for um, air source, haven't you? And then uh, underfloor heating. One of, right, the big, yeah. one of the big issues why you actually invited me on this tonight, something I mentioned the other day, it's like just looking at the, you know, performance of the building as a whole and that side of things and, you know, trying to get a grip. It's kind of, you've really got to try and break this down, which, I've, you know, I've gone slow over the report and breaking it down into steps we can actually implement now. You know, trying to look at the, the whole building as a thermal mass and heating that if we can. But, you know, silly things, even if right now we're still fitting gas boilers, well, let's look at the emitters. Let's make sure the flooring's right to store heat. Let's put under floor heat, you know, let's design it as low temp. Even if it is a gas boiler on the wall today, well, maybe in five or ten years, if the emitters are right and the pipeworks are all right, then it's just it's kind of, you know, pick those baby steps we could do today for the, you know, when we get the rest of the pieces of the puzzle sorted i'm just taking notes on that lee because that's really interesting and is, is there, yeah it's always research time for me is there anything you think so uh, for new build i think you know there's loads of progress you can make now and i think it wouldn't be that difficult to ban gas no. boilers from new build and you know, that's what the government's saying they're going to do in 2025 um you know fitting a heat pump to a new build is not that difficult uh, and the, the, the clever bit of the heat pump is now in a controller so you you sort of put it in and it can be a lot of it can be optimized um uh, online and you can sort of do lots of fault testing online but yeah. in terms of existing heating systems if you're going to someone's house to say do um, a maybe boiler replacement um, or some sort of servicing or maybe upgrading a radiator is there anything that you think you could go into that house and do at the same time that will make it more make it better prepared for a low temp heating system god there's loads we could do i think i genuinely think and you know it's great to have you guys on board with this but one of the first things we really need is research you won't believe simple questions like you know how do i set my programming should I have it on low all day? Do I have it at this times at night? And just simple things like that. It is so hard, whether you're Hound Energy Savings Plus or any of these bodies, to get mm. simple answers. So heating yeah. engineers don't know, and I desperately try to know and try and find actual research what's been done in people's houses, and it's atrocious. So a simple thing, obviously, there is the type of control on the wall, but how to set the times to best perform in an average house because the only answers you get is, oh, houses are all different. Oh, well, that's great, isn't it? Well, just give me an house. Just give me, I live in a three-bed, 1930s built semi, bare-fronted. Thousands and thousands of those around the country. Give me that as an example. And I can then work it out down to a small flat or upwards. New build, I think there's so many things we could do, like overnight, just for, you know, just a simple switching policy. Like you said, design the emitters so the high temp. Say that whatever heat, you know, and take the gas argument out of this, take whatever heat source you're putting in has to be within a certain percentage of the requirement of the building. So we're not putting a 40 kilowatt boiler in a building which needs five kilowatts, you know. And also make sure whatever the heat source is, is capable of ramping down to a certain level. Is another thing that just doesn't happen. You know, again, if we said what, if you maxed out at the maximum, but also said it had to ramp down to say 10% of the peak load, that this technology is out there, but it's just not regulated at the minute. And so it's a way we could easily get to grips with the wastage right now. Yeah, energy, and we're going to pick up on that. Energy wastage is something uh, some of us, we talk about a lot, don't we? I know Rob Berridge is a big sort of mm. opponent of this word. And we are wasting energy like uh, you wouldn't believe. And he's also uh, very, very much interested, as we all are, is one of the first things you can do in any home, whether you're retrofitting or, or the new build, is actually just work out the calculations how much heat does it need and then you've got a good starting point 
And we don't tend to do that in the heating industry. And unfortunately, the heating industry um, has been a little bit lack in, in, in pushing that little simple process. Um, you know, it hasn't really pushed it onto us. You know, we used to do it back in the day. I'm not saying that everyone back in the day was a greater engineer, not at all. But as, as our industry grew, and it did grow very, very quickly, um, it's uh, something that got lost in the ether somewhere. You know, just that simple calculation. Once you've got that calculation, and like Lee's saying, you know, we can build new houses. Um, you know, let's scrap high temp emitters and emitter systems and design them to be low temp. So even if a gas bore is going in like a year later, it can be swapped over quite effectively. But yeah, we, we start actually calculating homes right from, from the world go. Um, that, that's a good start anyway. Jan, what is the main sort of role you do at the, um, you, uh, the sort of RAP is the acronym I'm going to use again because it's a, easier to say <laughs> we say rap as well um it also sounds a lot better doesn't it than oh, so, yeah. regulatory assistance project now the name actually to explain where that comes from it was you know, three former regulators in the united states who thought you know we should train the next generation of regulators and you know maybe have a, a two-year project and got some funding for it that was in 92 so you know a long time ago and the project just continued and continued, and now we're going for 28 years. Uh, so we're still providing that same guidance to what is called regulators in the United States. We probably would more talk about policymakers in the UK. You know, people like uh, policymakers in Bayes, for example. I know you had a whole episode with Richard, I think, where you asked him the question, you know, what is a policymaker? And he gave a, a pretty interesting answer to that. Mm. Um, but yeah, we, we, we essentially advise people who craft, design and implement policy. That's, that's in essence what we're about. And we, we don't do that from a sort of purely academic perspective, but we look at what works elsewhere in the world. You know, what works well in the US, what works well in India and China, where we have offices, what works well in other European countries. And then we take those examples and present them to policymakers to pick you know, the best practices really to implement in a given location. So that, that really is what we are about. And my role is to direct a team of 14 people to do that work in Europe. And we all scattered across the United uh, Kingdom, but also the European Union. So you've mentioned other countries. I mean, is there a country that stands out that seems to be getting it right? I don't know, did you hear that, Jan? Sorry, Nathan. Am I, somehow my volume just dropped to zero. Um, can you say that again? Yeah, so you, you mentioned other countries. Is there, is there another country that, that seems to you to be getting this right or is it, you know, is, is doing things a little bit quicker and better maybe than the rest of us? So obviously interesting is Sweden um, to look at when we talk about heat pumps because they have, I think, the largest penetration uh, or Finland, I think they install the largest number of heat pumps per, um, per person per year. But they also have a very unique situation. You know, in Sweden, you have a lot of low carbon electricity, a lot of hydro, which is very different to um, you know, places that have a gas grid like the UK. But we can learn a lot, I think, from Sweden. And actually, Richard's uh, employer, the UK Energy Research Centre, they did some work, I think, a few years back and looked at Sweden and why they moved so fast on heat pumps. And the main lesson there, I think, was that actually you know, using heating oil and gas in Sweden is simply not competitive because the taxes are so much higher on, on fossil fuels than on the clean electricity. Um, and that's, of course, the reverse in the UK. We pay a lot more tax and levies for electricity than we put on heating oil and gas. Uh, and that distorts you know, the economic signals that the consumer is getting. Uh, and who can blame someone who's making a decision about a heating system if you want to go for the most cheapest op option, you probably are going to install a gas boiler in the UK, uh, unless you go into the octopus tariff like Richard and I have, and then you save some money, but most people won't even know what that is. I think what, what you're saying there about the energy prices is huge. I, I said it the other day again on Twitter, where it's at roughly 30 pounds a month averaged over the year is my space heating cost for this three bed semi. You know, if I spent 11 grand on a renewable system, then it's a 30 year payback, and that's if the energy is free. If I could literally spend £11,000 now, it would take 30 years to get that back. And again, it's because of this downward pressure on energy prices as much as anything. I'm not advocating at all with treble gas prices because there are people who genuinely struggle 
to pay that level of energy. But again, we're then back to that's because of how bad their systems are, how poorly insulated the houses are and the whole housing stock as a whole. But how are we doing for time, Nathan? <laughs> uh, the max, yeah, got, um... <laughs> yeah. I'm kidding, mate, I'm kidding. I was gonna, I was gonna ask you, because obviously you've got a customer base. Now, do, do, are they asking questions? Are they asking about renewable gen, uh, energy? When you go, when you get asked for quotes, or for, for instance, yeah, you know, I think we've all appreciated there's been a bit of a shift um, of the last couple of years, particularly people are more and more interested in it. But unfortunately, it still comes down to economics. It has to add up. I had a customer, you know, a couple big house who was looking at designing a system for, and he really wanted to go solar. Really wanted to go solar PV or solar thermal to heat his water, but he just said the numbers just couldn't add up. He bought a huge house, you know, it kind of it had a forty-three kilowatt heat requirement it was huge but when he was looking at i need to spend this on the windows this on that this on that it's a finite pot of money as it is for anyone and he just couldn't justify putting solar on because it just wasn't worth it for the money reasons and it's sad you know it's and this is quite a passionate guy who really wanted it so so how how do we solve these issues do you think richard like inspiring um well are you inspiring consumers that there is an option for them I mean, it's a hard one. Don't get me wrong. This is this is a very very big problem. Is it changed the mindset of our consumer base, which is a very diverse consumer base, and obviously some have access to money, some people don't have access to money. I mean, what sort of did your report sort of focus on this at all about what we could do with the consumer? I think so. In terms of the report, the the key takeaway for you know the industry really is that this needs to be packaged up by someone. So if you do get a heat pump and if you do the energy efficiency. Um, and if you use a time of use tariff, you can get these really significant carbon, uh, so you can get you know carbon reduction wins, um, but you can also get um, you know, cost minimal costs. So as, as Jan and I have both said, we've done this, um, and we're now paying basically less, less um, per unit of heat than we would be for gas in terms of our bills, mm. but there was still that big upfront cost of the heat pump in the first place. I was fairly savvy in that I got, um, a, a non-MCS registered um, heating engineer to install it and it was through this umbrella scheme. Mm -hmm. It wasn't easy, but it saved me some money. Mm. Uh, but still, um, I fundamentally think heat pumps are too expensive. Uh, and you know, we've got this really small market for heat pumps in the UK <coughs> and um, they, they should be less. There's just not enough competition uh, and they can be cheaper because they're actually fundamentally quite basic bits of kit. They're just big, big fridges. They we all know that. Um, so we need to get heat pumps cheaper as well and we need to sort of grow the market um, and in terms of the consumer side unfortunately you know it's it's like electric vehicles and solar so you might have people asking you to, for a solar installation um solar's got that sort of bling factor it's got that that shiny electronic uh, it's always referred to in the policy world as having a sort of sexy feel and it's the same with you know electric vehicles and teslas and stuff heating doesn't have that you know people don't even appreciate it a lot of the time that Heating is this particularly um, unsustainable thing that we do. So I don't, there's probably some sort of natural learning to go on, but at the same time, I think regulation has got to be in there. And um, as difficult as it might be, this balancing out the fact that you know, gas is uh, you know, higher carbon than electricity, um, or certainly using a heat pump is a lot more sustainable. But there's probably got to be some sort of pricing measure introduced at some point. Um, in the same way that we have, you know, we've increased car tax for the most polluting vehicles. You've probably got to do a lot of stuff together. So I don't know if that answers the question, Nathan, but basically there's lots to do um, and there's lots of different fronts where battles need to be fought. And, and who's, who's going to help us most with this, do you think? Or who should be helping us most with this? I mean, is it, does it always come down to government or is there things us, us installers should be doing? Um, well, I mean, the government's been saying for you know, since 2006 that we need to have loads and loads of heat pumps. And um, they put the RHI in place, and that came in you know, five, four years late, maybe. Um, and it's, it's been underperforming for all of those years. Um, so, yeah, I think a lot of this responsibility does sit with the government. They're fundamentally the people that you know, drive how infrastructure changes and you know, how these big sort of structures change in the world. Um, so... Uh, I don't want to say blame, but so some of the blame of why we haven't done much in the past few years does sit with them. Um, and if you look at the, re the announcements that have come out today about what the policy is, the new policy will be for 
a, a low carbon heating in the future. It's it's fine, but it doesn't no it doesn't increase the level of heat pumps. It's just sort of maintaining the market where it is now, which is you know miles away from where we need to be. Mm. Yeah, miles. I mean, Lee, yeah, so Lee what, what, as an engineer, is, what, is there something we can be doing? Well, something I was going to just say, following up on Rich's, but I mean, you, you'll have to forgive me, gents, but my pinned tweet at the minute on Twitter is an air source pump I took out and put a boiler in. And it's one of the things, as these policies, a gas boiler, uh, as yeah. these policies are implemented, it's getting that control and making sure things are installed right. I mean, that one in particular, it was a house with lots of microbar copper paperwork running around it, and the air source never worked, lots of problems. 10 years later of getting it repaired and repaired and repaired, got it ripped out because he still didn't want to rip up his very expensive tiled flooring and destroy his house to repipe it. Fair enough. You know, you can understand somebody not wanting to tear the house apart. So mm. that, that was that example. But the, this goes back, that was an RHI. He might still be getting payment, actually. Might have to remove the address. Um, <laughs> but the problem with that is that the installers were allowed to just stick an air source pump on an unsuitable system. And that feeds into the culture and the demand and people hearing, oh, so-and-so down the street had his took out. It's rubbish. But a lot of engineers have that perspective. My own experience of air source heat pumps is they don't particularly work well because I only come across them not working when I'm coming across, you know, changing two-part valves. And it's all for this very reason. They've been stuck on houses that should have never been put on because there was good grants available. That was this heat pump, isn't it, Lee? That's the one. That's the <laughs> yeah. one, yeah. And, it I, was in, it was, and that was the condition it was in when I got to the job. So. Yeah, but I remember seeing it, and I think that was a, was it a Husky heat pump? Yeah. So, I mean, they, they, they've gone bust. Um, and uh, if <laughs> that, you look yeah. at, so, because I was really interested, because this company emerged um, when the RHI sort of first started going for domestic, and it suddenly became this thing, and... Uh, I thought that sounds too good to be true. And they're saying, you know, <laughs> going to be cheaper than gas. I'm thinking, well, that's a really good thing. And uh, I think they were made in Liverpool or they were made somewhere like that. Um, somewhere, was it Liverpool way, I think? I think they were yeah, I'm not, it's, I um, think it might be in Yorkshire, but yeah, it was up there, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, but um, you, you just Google that one company and you hear these horror stories about Husky yeah. heat pumps. Um, and then you follow the trail in terms of the company's house stuff. Um, and they had like directors who were registered to run 300 companies and stuff like that. And it was a really terrible company, but somehow they got through all of the checks that allowed them to become um, MCS accredited. Um, and it's staggering that, you know, after however many years that heat pump was in, I, I think the, the elements were rotting out of it from the inside, weren't they? Yeah, I mean, there was problems with the actual, the wet side of the installation, which I won't go into, but the actual pump outside, it kept breaking down. It was poor mm. quality. It was a cheap import, rebranded as Husky or whatever name was on it. And the homeowner actually couldn't get, well, got to the point he tried as hard as he could to get spares for it. And that was because obviously the impellers had actually gone, as you can see by that picture. And that was the final thing. Like, mm. and that, but that's just a simple thing of quality control. Mm. And that's an issue we have right now in gas boilers, which can be so cheap. You, know, you, can, yeah. go, you can spend 400 quid on a gas boiler right now. It's not going to be very good. It's not going to ramp down very low. It's not going to be compatible with fancy controls. But they're out there, and again, it's just one of the many pieces mm. of the puzzle, isn't it? It's just yeah. I mean, that that's been a major uh, success in Sweden. I think that they had the same problems. I think in the eighties, when consumer confidence in the products was really low. Um, yeah. yeah, there were lots of problems, poor performance. Yeah, you know, there's kinds of things that you described. Lee, you know, the wrong the wrong technology in the wrong house, and yeah. they set up, I think, a consumer council where you could you could go as as someone who you know had bought a product that didn't perform and over time they ironed out the, the kind of cowboys in the industry and made sure that there were good training standards you know that were adhered to across the entire industry and I think now confidence is very high in, in, in heating technology in Sweden which I think comes down to actually the government setting up this consumer council ultimately and having really high quality standards uh, and that's the sort of thing I'd like to see more of in the UK you know good examples that you know, old buildings of different types actually working well. Um, it's, and it's a difficult one because the UK is the oldest housing stock in Europe. And we often forget that, you know, that we have a very difficult housing stock. I, I grew up in Germany and we have a lot of houses that have been built after the war. And you know, they're much more efficient, a lot easier to install these heating systems. Mm. But in the UK, you know, you live, most people live in really old houses. It's just a completely yeah. different situation. There's a, it's a very important point. We've, we've got this very diverse old housing stock and we've got one of the most diverse populations on the planet. 
And, you know, it's the people that live in these homes are very important as well. Uh, you know, an important factor about, you know, to, in implementing this sort of new, this new sort of technology. Because, you know, I, I grew up in, um, oh, something's come up on my Zoom. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to press the cross. Oh, we've been yes. upgraded. And so I, I grew up in uh, East Anglia and lots of oil. And my dad was, you know, a lot of his customers, I mean, he's 76 at the moment. And I mean, a lot of his customers are, are way older than him. And, you know, they still have open fires. Um, uh, you know, they, they, they live in a very different sort of world to what are, I, I don't know, ma mainstream journalists or whoever actually thinks something we all live. I mean, they do really live in a different world. And it's going to be hard implementing this technology into, pe into homes like that, for instance. Um, you know, as much as there's passionate people like myself about renewable technology, how do you change the mindset of some, you know, an old couple that are in their 90s that are quite happy with their little backboard, a coal fire backboard? I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a conundrum. Um, we, we've talked about training. So, someone, I think Jan mentioned training about uh, in, in Sweden. Now, Lee, Lee and I would know that the training issue in the UK isn't quite right i'm quite uh, i'm well known for talking about training in, in in the uk and our training regimes i don't think they're fit for purpose i don't think anyone's to blame but i definitely don't think they're fit for purpose i think there needs to be a whole paradigm shift of how we train people and unfortunately the structures i see that are kind of involved with training seem to still have the old models they like they can't come away from the old model and i often say you know qualifications doesn't mean competence you know we're teaching people to be qualified we're not training them to be competent and there's a big difference so there deep needs to be a major shift in how we train engineers you know there's there's fantastic engineers like lee uh you know who are prepared for that <laughs> and, and as lee and i lee will tell you, you know we're, we're all learning off of social media there's a lot of peer learning going on and no one's actually sort of capturing that really and formalizing that and that's something that should be done within training i mean does your did your policy uh, did your report, Richard, actually touch on training issues at all? No, we didn't really look at training. Actually, we looked at sort of a, an international perspective in terms of how you can fit electrification as a big thing into you no know, national energy system. So um, we, we didn't look specifically at training. Um, I think it does vary significantly between countries. Mm -hmm. And I was having a chat again via Twitter mm -hmm. at the weekend about you know, the, the the regime or the system the, the the French use for heating controls mm. uh, and someone said uh, that someone that used to actually be in charge of the renewable heat incentive policy uh, was saying that when he lived in France um, his oil heating system a decade ago um, had full weather compensation um, and um, it was fully automated and had no thermostats um, and I mean that is so far away from where we are uh, and <laughs> there's just so many different standards between different countries that I don't think there's one thing you can say about training um, and you know look at how actually builders uh, like are sort of governed in Germany you, know, you, you have this federation of master builders and to be in charge of a job you have to be a fully you know uh, a, a sort of accredited builder um, in the UK that just isn't isn't the case um, and you know you don't need to have any qualifications necessarily to do any of this stuff I mean Lee I, I think you I think you made the tweet this I don't know if I should do uh, I'm trying to think of my off gym rules here but you know, <laughs> be careful you, you made the tweet uh, possibly the biggest largest boiler company on the planet how their Twitter header banner has gas boilers on on their UK Twitter feed but in France it has uh, air sort of heat oh that 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 wasn't me actually so oh, you're, wasn't not, you? you're not implicating me but no yes there was a large manufacturer yeah and it was just that difference on the UK page had a gas boiler as its look at our product and yeah the fringe page was the it's air. interesting so that manufacturer and I, am i allowed to name them nathan because i've spoken to them before i'm and, a, uh, I'm a, I'm a valent installer so yeah, i can yeah. name it they're a wonderful so, company I love yeah they the are products. a good company and they make very good air source heat pumps as well they, do. they they're oh. a big manufacturer of air source heat pumps um but when i spoke to um someone from valent they said that if if the uk market were to switch to air source heat pumps they could literally have uh, a manufacturing line within two weeks set up to build air source heat pumps in the UK. Yep. Um, it is possible, and uh, you know, none of this is sort of, it's not rocket science, putting a heat pump in a house. Uh, so, um, yeah, I'm not surprised that they have a gas boiler because they sell a lot more gas boilers in the UK. 
Um, but in, in France, you know, gas heating isn't as big a thing and they have more people on electric heating. So um, that probably shouldn't surprise us too much. Yeah, we, we actually found the same in our work in Poland, which is, you know, Poland is even worse because they have maybe coal uh, heating. Yes, really inefficient coal heating and really polluting. Uh, really bad air quality, and and you know I met went to talk at the annual gathering of the heat pump association, and there were 600 people, and a lot of the people from industry, they were coal boiler manufacturers, and I was astounded and asked them why they showed up at that gathering, but they said you know we see the market is changing, and we actually have the skills to install a new product, um, and you know we actually want to make an investment in in this area and train people up and uh, develop a new skill set. And mm -hmm. I was really astounded by how uh, agile these companies can be, you know, once they see that there's a clear direction of travel. And I think that's what we're lacking in the UK right now. It's not clear where, the, what is the direction of travel? We have you know, piecemeal approach to this whole topic. You, you, you're right. I mean, like, like we've just mentioned, so Valent are very, I mean, I know a lot of people in Valent, a great company, there's some great, great people. All the boiler manufacturers in the UK have some great, great people. And, they are hedging their bets. Uh, you can't blame them. You know, well, you can't blame them, I suppose. I mean, there are, there are some, as we know, of, and I'm not going to mention them, but they are, they are going down the hydrogen route. Um, that's the sort of the game plan they're betting on. But, I mean, they, they, they're quite capable of, of switching as well. Um, it's just about sort of maybe uh, encouraging them. Nudging, I think, is the, is the new word of, <laughs> of this decade. It's nudging them along the right lines. But um, I don't know how that's going to go. But... Um, well, it looks like we've got our 40 minutes. Of that, that, so that went quite quick. And I only get 40 <laughs> minutes, apparently, on this, on this Zoom <laughs> package that I have. So uh, I think we'll, we'll revisit this topic uh, again, obviously. And, um, you know, Rich is a usual guest. I've had uh, Lee on before. Jan, it's very, very nice to have you. And I'm sure we're going to do plenty more as well. Um, we're all going to look uh, nice on YouTube when I upload it, because obviously I'm well known for my podcast that's just audio. So... No one actually ever sees me. <laughs> Next time, I'm going to get a bookcase like Lee. <laughs> oh, it's all in the staging. <laughs> so thank you ever so much, uh, gentlemen, for joining me. Um, stay safe because this is during lockdown. And uh, have a good evening. And it's nice to see you all. Cheers, Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Yeah.